Let's pray. Father, as we go to your sacred word this morning, use the words that you've given to us, written on these pages, to touch our hearts, to shape our characters, to move us, Father, into a closer walk with you, that we might serve you, Father, day by day, to reach a world languishing and perishing for the goodness and grace that you have bestowed upon us. So, Father, give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to receive your grace. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. If I have a choice to learn the hard way, do you know what I'm talking about? Or learn from somebody else's mistakes. I think I'd, I'm just old enough, I'd rather do the latter. I used to be bullheaded enough that I'd do the former. How is it with you? Do you like to learn the hard way? Or do you like to kind of learn from other people, other people's example and life history? The book of Acts... I believe, was given as case history and an opportunity to learn how the gospel went forward. And I believe that it is applicable to us today also. This is a second in a series that we're looking at. The first was uh, last week, and they put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. You see, in the time of the apostles, the Jews understood themselves to be God's people. And anyone who was not a Jew was a Gentile. And they were outside of the blessings of God. And we look carefully at that. And this, the message was us and them. And we came to understand that God's goodness spans that gap between the chosen and, quote, them. That goodness and grace is not bestowed just upon a few, but God's goodness and grace extends to everyone. Do you believe that, friends, today? Isn't it an amazing thing that God's goodness and grace extends to us and beyond us to each person who will receive it? today. Our message today is entitled Character 101, Principle versus Prejudice, looking at it from God's view. There are three words that I'd like to just use as kind of an outline for today's message. First is identity. We all identify, uh, we all identify with words, different words, and groups identify and label themselves with labels. Labels are an interesting thing. Labels can be used in a very positive way and in a very negative way. But how is it that you would identify or what would you use to identify yourself? Just to use uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit of background, when I say LA, what comes to mind? LA what? Dodgers, thank you. What else? L.A. Rams. L.A. What? Traffic. L.A. Lakers, Lakers. thank you. Took a little nibbling to get there. Now, there's a reason that I was looking and fishing for L.A. Lakers. Because all of you good old L.A. Lakers fans... um, L.A. Lakers fans know their history and identity. For you see that they were indeed immigrants to L.A. From what land did they journey from? Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Thank you. Born and raised, they migrated about the second year I was in school as basketball champions. After they migrated to L.A., 
as of Wikipedia reports 2015, they had won at least 15 championships. Can any good thing come out of Minneapolis, I ask you? And the answer is yes. As I migrated, they indeed have done a splendid job. I must confess, in my earlier days, spending many hours behind our elementary school, swishing a few basketballs through the netless hoop from the three-point line, somehow those skills that you don't keep current, you lose. But I would ask you today, how many of you here today were born and raised in L.A.? Born and raised in L.A.? Oh my goodness, not very many. How many of you migrated to L.A.? Raise your hands. That's the vast majority of you. We all gather with different backgrounds and different identities to this place. I'd like to take you back to the early Christian church, the early Christian church in Acts chapter 17, to look at how they identified themselves. For you see, the church, I believe today, has a unique identity and a unique message and a unique calling and a unique purpose. And depending upon who you ask and how you ask it, you might get many different answers today. The church today, some would say, they should be known as the end time movement to take people back to a certain point in time around circa 1840 or 1888. And we should be known as the church just before Jesus comes as the pure people of God and the remnant of God. Do you believe that to be the case, my friend? Oh, you want to know how I'm going to answer before you answer, huh? We should be known as a unique people. Acts chapter 17 tells us what our uniqueness is all about. Acts chapter 17, looking at verse 3, an opening in verse 2, And Paul, as his manner was, went into them for three Sabbath days, and he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must, must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. That doesn't come as anything new, anything startled, or anything transforming initially, does it? Unless you were a Jew in the time that Paul was preaching. Because the Jews understood that Jesus was not the Messiah. And he's telling them, the Messiah is in your midst. He lived, he was crucified, and he lives again today. Is that good news, friends? That is good news. I believe Seventh-day Adventist Christians living today have a message to give to their neighbors, their friends, their loved ones, that needs to come through quite clear and unequivocal and the message is that Christ lives. He was crucified for my sin, for your sin. His goodness, his death on the cross allows us to have forgiveness. Anything else is a substitutionary gospel. Anything else is an obscurification of the message of Christ today. We must identify as the disciples identified with Christ crucified, Christ risen, and Christ calling us to follow him today. Verse 6 says, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain other brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Do you like that verse? I believe, friends, God wants his people 
to go forward in a mighty way that Santa Clarita will be turned upside down. No longer the same. Those Seventh-day Adventists have such a tight, close relationship with Christ. They've got something that I've got to find out about. When's the last time somebody came up to you and said, you know, you better be quiet. You better not talk so much about Christ. You know why they're not saying that? Because we're not doing it. That'll catch up with you about Tuesday. It ought to be said that those Christians on Valley Street are so connected with Christ, they're troubling my conscience. They're troubling and stirring things up in a city. Good things, I would hope. And they talk about Jesus all the time. When they bump into you at the store, somehow in the conversation, the blessings of following Christ comes up. Somehow, when you're down, you can call somebody who goes to the Adventist church. And before the conversation, you'll feel better. There are those you call it. I'm going to go to meddling. There are those you'll call in the Adventist church. If you call them, you'll learn all about what you should eat and how much. And what you shouldn't eat and why you shouldn't eat it. And they have an identity that is not identified with the gospel. Where is your identity found today? Because your identity must be in Christ if you want to have something to offer the world today. So identity is critically important. Where you're from is important, and we all carry identities in different backgrounds. But against that identity is how we are known in the public. For you see, there are two different things that can shape our lives. And I'm going to go to the negative side. And if it causes vis any visceral reactions with you today, I want to be like the dentist that says this part, you might feel a little pinch. It might cause a little pain. I'm not meaning for it to, but your history, your personal history, might be such that it does. For you see, in character formation, we can be principled people, or we can be prejudicial people. I would hesitate to take a vote because I think I already know how it would go. No one would intentionally choose to be a people of prejudice, would they? But I want to just mention some words. Let me give you a classical definition. Prejudice, a preconceived opinion that's not based on reason or actual experience. Not based on reason or actual experience. A prejudicial statement might be something like this. Anyone with blue eyes, I have blue eyes, I think. Anyone with blue eyes should not speak on Wednesday at all. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? You might ask the person why. And he or she might say something like this. Well, my grandfather told me that because he came home late, very, very late Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning. He had worked all night. And he said, all of you kids who have blue eyes shouldn't speak on Wednesday. Never gave us a reason, but we respected our grandfather. Didn't say a word, and he got plenty of sleep. And they grew up believing that that was a life commandment. And you kind of chuckle and go, hmm, wonder how that really works. Let me mention just a few words without comment. Some that will 
will cause some emotions to come forward. Words like equality, words like heritage, class, diversity, history, family status, wealth, poor, location of where you live, the car you drive, religion, skin color, language, attitude, gender, education, job, abuse. Which of those words are loaded with a potential for prejudice? Because at times, we don't even realize our prejudice, do we? Sometimes it's intentional, and sometimes it's not intentional. But as Christians and followers of Christ, we must be principle-driven. James chapter 2, read the entire chapter. It says, Woe to you, brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing gold and fine clothes, and a poor man comes in wearing filthy old clothes also. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, Here, here's a good seat, but you say to the poor man, Stand off over there. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom promised for those who love him? But you've dishonored God in the way you are doing things. So I start to that far side. Because it can be so painful and unintentional. And then I move to the, to the side of these extremes. That those who are following Christ will be principle based in their conduct and in their actions. Principle based, a principle is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of belief and or behavior. So, what type of Christian shall we be? Shall we be a, a Christian that is just blown about by the winds of the time, by whatever is happening in politics today, or whatever the fad is on the internet, or whatever happens to be coming my way, and figure out what I believe as I go along. And as Paul is on Mars Hill, set before him is the unknown God of how many gods he knows not. Or shall we say today, I want my life to be based on what the Lord Jesus Christ has taught us in his sacred word. Principle-based people, I'm just going to share with you some of the characteristics without comment. They're committed, they're consistent, they're kind, they're caring, they're compassionate, they're truthful, they're tactful, they're thankful, they are a people of integrity, they are a humble people. Wouldn't you like to be around people like them? Wouldn't you like, do you like to be around people that are humble and tactful and kind? and compassionate. They seek God's will. They seek God's word. They seek God's spirit. They design their lives to live according to God's design. So I ask you today, friends, we're living in the last days of earth's history. We're living in a world that long for an expression of what it means to be a Christian. What type of message will you take to a perishing world? Will it be one that is shaped, shaped after what you personally believe the gospel to be? Or will it be the message of our Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified on the cross? and him buried 
and lifting him up as a resurrected Lord and Savior. That, I believe, friends, is the character that Christ wants us to put on. That character of being real troublemakers in this world. That character of turning things upside down. Have you been in trouble for Jesus last week? Do you like mischief? Do you like ma'am? I hope, I hope my phone rings this week. Pastor, is so-and-so a member of your church? I usually have to hold my breath ever when that call comes, just for a moment. Well, tell me, what seems to be the matter? They were at my neighbor's house last night. And my neighbor came over and told me they were such kind, gracious, loving people. They were inviting me to meet with them next week. Yep, those are my members. It's an amazing thing when the gospel permeates our hearts and lives, how it transforms us and Christ lives in us, how those issues that so easily beset us when troubles come, we go to our Lord Jesus Christ and say, Father, Father, fill us with your spirit. Shape our characters. Give us the words and the actions to reach into people's hearts in life that just like the disciples, they might go forward and say, these people have been with Jesus. I want what they have. And then the world will be turned upside down. Let us pray. Father, your power is not limited by time or space. Your power is only limited by our willingness to be filled by your Spirit. We have to say, Father, as we worship you today, that at times we've been so busy, at times we've been so anxious, at times we've been so discouraged, at times we've been so lonely, we've turned away, we've distanced ourselves from you. But we would ask, Father, just as your disciples asked, fill us, Father, with your spirit. Give us your words and your actions that we might lift up Jesus, that we might present him as the only Savior that this world has, him crucified, Jesus buried, and Jesus resurrected. Our only hope, Father, for forgiveness, for power to live for you. That this city might say, they're turning this world upside down. That we might glorify you, Father, through our lives filled with character, principal character, proclaiming Christ. We ask in his precious name, Amen.